Well, it's a great honor, John, to be asked to introduce you, and it's a great honor that you have come to be with us this evening. John Deere is an internationally recognized voice for peace and nonviolence in the world. He's a Roman Catholic priest. He's an activist, having been arrested 85 times or more, served several prison sentences along with the Berrigans, other well-known activists in America. And he's an author of 40 books. Um, the one we're all familiar with, John, is this one, of course, uh, The Sacrament of Civil Disobedience. And it's wonderful to have it around for us to be reading now. I'm going to leave you to mention your most recent book, which I know is dear to your heart. Um, you have been, for many years, you were a director of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, the biggest interfaith uh, peace organization in the States. You have been um, a parish priest in New, New Mexico, and you were also on the ground as a pastor and chaplain at, after 9-11, working to help the many traumatized people there. You've helped Pope Francis. Um, I think you've been summoned to the Vatican to various um, seminars and think tanks about peace and nonviolence. And you've also helped him, I think it was 19, uh, 2017, beg your pardon, um, draft his uh, uh, speech on peace that was uh, one of the first or the first acknowledgements and statements about peace and nonviolence from the Catholic Church. Um, you are currently uh, the founder and director of the, uh, the Beatitude Center in California, the Beatitude Center for the Nonviolent Jesus. And I can vouch for the wonderful seminars you put on with people from the very most interesting areas of peace and nonviolence. But most of all, you're a beautiful person and you're such an encourager to the rest of us who struggle much later uh, coming to the field than you have. So thank you for coming and we look forward to all that you have to do to us this evening. Thank you, Sue. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Sue. Um, and uh, thank you, Val and Joe and Talia and Caroline, if you're there, and everybody. So pres I presume, uh, Val and Sue, you can see me and I'm all set here? Yeah. Oh, good. So I really... I I really just want to thank you all for all the great things you're doing with Christian Climate Action and all of you for everything you do for peace and justice and creation. And I really just want to encourage you to keep at it. You know, uh, I uh, will probably speak maybe for, you know, up to 30 minutes and happy to take questions and comments and reflections. I'm real happy to be here, but just real grateful for all you do. Um I, I, I'll tell you a little bit about my civil disobedience, and then I have kind of five themes. That's my goal here. And uh, I'm 64 now. And uh, as Sue said, well, I probably attended or organized thousands of demonstrations like all of you. But I've been arrested eight, at least 85 times over the last 40 years, which means I've been preparing for civil disobedience in court or preparing for court recovering for court, under house arrest, and preparing for the next action my entire adult life. And uh, that's because I became friends with these legendary activists, Daniel and Philip Berrigan, my friends, who told me when I was 21, go get arrested and report back to us. And I did. And now I have this problem with recidivism, as you heard. Um, I was thinking this morning, you know, I've talked all my life. My work is to teach nonviolence and the nonviolence of Jesus. But we live in the empire. So I've been saying nonviolence as a way of life 
But really, with the Berrigans, it was nonviolent resistance to the whole culture of violence and war and death and destruction as a way of life. But really, for me, with the Berrigans, it was nonviolent civil disobedience to the structures of injustice and death and destruction as a way of life. Um, trying to follow Jesus and live in the Acts of the Apostles, like as if we're, we're living in a new chapter. So I, I was thinking about it. I've been part of many campaigns. Uh, for example, Dan and I and our friends in New York City got arrested every three months at the Riverside Research Institute, right at Times Square in a tall apartment building, which was the leftover of... Uh, the Manhattan Project, which built the bomb, and they were doing post-nuclear laser beam research. And we disrupted the whole building every three months for 10 years and got arrested and spent a day or two in jail until they closed it. Uh, and then for many years, I was on the board and organized for the Nevada Desert Experience. And we brought in 25,000 people to the middle of nowhere, the desert of Nevada, every Lent, so it was a religious thing where you walked onto the desert, got arrested, spent the day in the jail and were arrested for protesting nuclear weapons testing until they stopped it. And they did. Uh, and uh, there's so many other campaigns. I don't even remember them. Concord Naval Weapons Station in California. I've been arrested there many times where they shipped all the weapons to Vietnam and then Central America and then. Livermore Labs, West Point, the Strategic Air Command, some of these places I'm banned for life, thank you very much. And the Trident submarine bases in Seattle, Connecticut, and Georgia. Um, what else? The White House, the US Capitol, the Supreme Court, the State Department, various federal buildings. I remember once in 30 years ago, we dumped a pile of furniture in front of the U.S. Capitol to protest lack of funding for the homeless. We faced a year in prison for that. We had this big public trial, and the judge found us not guilty. It was front page news in the Washington Post. We're trying to advocate for the homeless. Um, I'm thinking that we were at once at the School of the Americas in Georgia, which is where we train all the soldiers of Latin America, how to torture. You know, we had a big campaign there and I was arrested once with 4,400 people. It was an amazing experience. Um, in 1993 in Connecticut, as they were launching the Trident submarine into the river, out into the ocean, four of us rode a canoe down the river and disrupted the whole launch. They had 10,000 people in the U.S. Navy celebrating the launch of the end of the world. And uh, we stopped it, <laughs> as you do, and uh, faced a year in prison. And then I went into court and made a big speech, and the judge dismissed it. Uh, my last arrest was just before the pandemic with Jane Fonda, when she launched every Friday civil disobedience at the U.S. Capitol, and our group, 150 of us, were arrested blocking the Senate office buildings uh, to protest, um, you know, support for fossil fuel industries. And my most notorious action was my plowshares action. That was uh, in, well, you know, in, 19, I think you all know this, in uh, 19, uh, 1980, Dan and Phil Berrigan, walked with eight with six friends walked into the nuclear weapons facility near Philadelphia found an unarmed nuclear weapons nose cone and hammered on it and there have been a hundred of these actions since and I did about the 50th one in 1993 with Phil and two friends we walked into the Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in North Carolina in at four in the morning it was like three Heathrow airports. There were 75 F-15 nuclear fighter bombers laid out and 10,000 soldiers milling about. We walked right through them. And I went up to a plane and I hammered on it once. As I said in court, we're doing what Isaiah said. They're going to beat swords into plowshares. This is what I told the judge. And what Jesus said when he gave us that famous commandment, love your enemies, don't nuke them. 
And that didn't go over too well. But it was amazing. We didn't know it was the Holy Spirit. We were walking right into the annual national war games of the United States. And we shut it all down. And all the generals got fired because how did we get in? <laughs> I don't know how we got in. Again, it was the Holy Spirit. And for that act, I faced 20 years in prison and um, found guilty of many felony charges. I can't vote in a lot of places, can't travel to a lot of countries, including Canada. I'm highly monitored by the government. So I'd like to say hello to all the government people who are listening. And, um, and you know, we do what we can. Uh, so that's where I'm coming from as I share these thoughts of mine. Now, if you've seen the book, th these are the these are what I this is what I've learned after a lifetime of civil disobedience. And I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just sharing with you what I've learned. For those of you who have engaged in civil disobedience or are going to, as part of Christian climate action, given the state of the world, first, the old lesson: positive social change can only come. I think this only comes from bottom-up, people power, grassroots movements of nonviolence, from Jesus to Gandhi and Dr. King, where nonviolence becomes contagious and electrifying and the change happens, so that the British leave India and segregation falls under Martin Luther King in the civil rights movement, or Marcos leaves the Philippines when a million people led by the nuns, take to the streets, or communism, the Soviet Union, and apartheid fall. When Charles Taylor flees Liberia after killing 200,000 people because Lima Gaboe gets 100,000 women in the streets and they refuse to leave. You, you can't, what are you going to do? <laughs> and uh, so the abolitionists, the suffragists, the women's movement, the labor movement, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, and the anti-nuclear movements, um, but starting with Jesus, who began this gospel movement, positive social change comes through risk and sacrifice. That is through costly, meticulous, prayerful, active, creative, disarming, loving, revolutionary nonviolence. In a world of total violence, addicted to violence and death to the point of we're going to destroy the planet, total nonviolence is revolutionary and illegal. But in all of these movements, now I've studied this with my friend Howard Zinn, the great U.S. historian, there have to be some people on the front lines who do what Sue Parfit calls in her great new book, they put their bodies on the line nonviolently. And here's the teaching that I learned as a kid from the Berrigans. In the end, the change happens when some front line people Good people break bad laws which legalize injustice, war, nuclear weapons, global destruction and fossil fuels, and they peacefully accept the consequences of their nonviolent action. If it's done in a spirit of prayer and total nonviolence, then unearned suffering love becomes contagious. That's what Dr. King said from Jesus to Gandhi. We see that in the life of Jesus to everybody involved in this. And the more you practice it, and this is the tough spot, the more you accept suffering without a trace of retaliation in your heart, while you insist on the truth of justice, climate justice, love, forgiveness, the more then for us as Christians, we can enter into the story of the nonviolent Jesus. So what we're talking about, what my second point will be is we're participating in the paschal mystery of Jesus. Disarmament, climate justice, and peace come about as Christians take up the cross and risk resurrection for justice and creation. I do not say that lightly. It has taken me my whole life to learn that the hard way. And uh, I, don't, I don't know anybody who's sane now in the world. And I'm, it's not me. This is what the tradition says. So my second point for us as Christians, now I'm talking about us as Christians, nonviolent civil disobedience is about discipleship, 
to the nonviolent, civilly disobedient Jesus. I'm going to say that again because it shocks me. Nonviolent civil disobedience is about discipleship to the nonviolent civil civilly disobedient Jesus. And you're going, John, I thought we were going to be talking about climate change. We are. How to resist it. If you're a Christian, you take up nonviolence, the way of Jesus. The cross is total nonviolent resistance to the culture, which means some of us have to go all the way to Jerusalem and engage in nonviolent civil disobedience. Now, what I was trying to say in my book, The Sacrament of Civil Disobedience, is that <laughs> I'm going to laugh even as I say it because I still can't believe it. Everything Jesus did was illegal. In a world of total violence, if he's the greatest person of total nonviolence in history, that's what Gandhi said about Jesus, then everything he does is illegal. Everything he did was active, daring, public, bold, provocative, dangerous, revolutionary, nonviolent civil disobedience. I mean, you and I, I mean, all my actions and in and out, many actions where they didn't arrest us and you're disappointed. That's what Jesus is like, was like every 15 minutes. He just, he didn't even have to speak. He showed up and they wanted to arrest him and kill him from day one. This is the guy we follow. At least that's what I was told. What did he do? I mean, proclaiming God's kingdom is illegal because it's also denouncing the empire. He broke the Sabbath laws over and over again to make a point to heal sisters and brothers. The guy with the withered hand, lepers, the blind, women, they were eating the corn on the Sabbath. He broke all the cleanliness laws. He visited enemy territory and loved his enemies. I mean, you can be killed for doing that. He's telling people not to pay taxes. That's one of the charges brought against him uh, to Pilate in Luke's version. And he enters Jerusalem as a nonviolent king in classic street theater, which is a tool in the arsenal of nonviolent resistance. But he goes into the temple, engages in civil disobedience. That's why I always joke that Jesus is just a one-man crime wave walking through the Roman Empire. I thought you'd all laugh at that, but anyway. Gandhi said Jesus is the greatest nonviolent resistor in history. And the only people on the planet who don't know that Jesus is nonviolent are Christians. It's so discouraging. Jesus teaches spectacular nonviolence in the Sermon on the Mount. He organizes his followers on a campaign to go ahead of him like lambs into the midst of wolves. And they're to do three things. To heal all the people of violence and war. To expel all the demons of what? Imperialism, greed, violence, death, destruction, destroying Mother Earth. And um, to proclaim the coming of God's reign of total nonviolence, which means universal love, universal justice, universal peace here on earth, which means the end of the Roman Empire, which means the end of the United Kingdom, by the way, and Russia and China and the United States and Israel and Hamas and Al Qaeda. And we can just go on down the list, every nation state. We're talking about. God's reign of total nonviolence being welcomed here on earth. Jesus is like Gandhi on the Salt March. He's like Dr. King on the Selma March or the Poor People's Campaign. Jesus organizes the poor and marches in total nonviolence to Jerusalem, where he enters the temple, where all the religious authorities work with the empire to rip off all the poor by making them buy really expensive lambs and doves in order to worship God. And he turns over the tables tables of the bankers. Can you imagine the bankers inside the temple and um, says no more injustice. This is a house of prayer. Well, they, you do civil disobedience like that in the center of the empire in the Middle East in that day, you're going to be executed within 24 hours. And that's what happens. Um, notice Jesus is not passive and he's not afraid uh, He's totally disruptive, totally dangerous, civilly disobedient, illegal, a threat to the whole religious establishment and the Roman Empire. But he's totally nonviolent. He doesn't hit anybody or hurt anybody. There is no whip, except 
in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, only 50 years later, does it say he may, he took the cord used to bring 50,000 animals up into the temple and he drove the animals out. He doesn't whip people. If anything, he's a nonviolent animal rights activist too. He saved all their lives. And then he, it only lasted a few minutes and he spent the rest of the day teaching and the crowds were astonished and listened to him. If you read the fine print. And so for the next three centuries, this is how Christians lived. You refuse to join the Roman military or to take the oath to Caesar in your baptism. And so you were qu killed that afternoon. Um, I want to focus the, uh, that uh, Jesus, uh, you know, he was not angry. He doesn't do violence. He doesn't yell. He's not hitting people, hurting people, killing people. But this is the point lost on everybody and what I've been working on for many years. And theologians and scripture scholars don't know this because they have an experience of disobedience. You can't go in screaming and yelling and call yourself nonviolent. No, Jesus is, dear friends, Jesus is grieving. Go and study it in Luke. He gets to Jerusalem, he sees it, and he breaks down sobbing. If only you had understood the things that make for peace. You and I give up at grief. Jesus grieves and takes action and does civil disobedience. In the Sermon on the Mount, then, he says, as I explain in my new book, Commentary on the Gospels, um, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches the emotional life of nonviolence. Don't be afraid and don't be angry. Grieve and rejoice. Now, I could talk all day about that because that's been a long journey for me, too. We're grieving what's happening in the Middle East and to Mother Earth and to all the poor. And we're rejoicing that we get to be persecuted in for following Jesus. That's life of nonviolence. So here we are today in the world of permanent war. 13,000 nuclear weapons can blow up the planet many times over. Corporate greed leaving billions and barely surviving. War against total war on the poor and on children and now on Mother Earth. They were going to destroy Mother Earth. If Jesus was upset about the injustice in the temple, to the point that he gave his life in nonviolent civil disobedience, what would he say about how we are destroying the temple of Mother Earth with nuclear weapons and fossil fuels? I just leave that question for us. So, you know, if you study his actual arrest, you notice that when they came to arrest him, He's unarmed and he doesn't fight back. This is important. But Peter and the gangs take up a sword. They're scared and they think that, well, this is a just war. And they go to kill to protect Jesus. And just then the commandment comes down, put down the sword. These are the last words of Jesus to the church, to his community before he was arrested and died. It's the last thing they all heard him say. It's the first time they understood how serious he was about nonviolence that we don't get to use violence in our resistance. So they all run away and leave him alone. And Gandhi's writings are incredible. They say he goes through his arrest, jail, trial, torture, and execution in meticulous nonviolence, every second surrendering himself to God. That's the key. That's the key to all of this. The prayer is told in Luke in the Garden of Gethsemane. And our prayer as his followers from now on is not my will, your will be done. Like the Lord's prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's our prayer. So what I don't, one of the shocking things I learned from Daniel Berrigan is he told me when I was a kid, <laughs> it's so obvious. The arrest and execution of the nonviolent Jesus is totally meticulously legal. Just as the destruction of the planet is legal. The crucifixion of Mother Earth is legal. It's legal to plan to blow up the planet. Therefore, the resurrection of the totally nonviolent Jesus is totally illegal. It was an act of nonviolent civil disobedience. And in Gospel of Matthew, they emphasize it. They say, the Romans put the imperial seal on the stone and said, okay, we killed you. 
you're dead. Now stay dead. But he breaks the law and he comes out and he's wandering the land today, inspiring people all over the world to become followers of his nonviolence, global grassroots movements of nonviolence to stop the killing and save humanity and creation. And that's the story of the Acts of the Apostles. The early fossil, the early followers, they see taking up the cross as nonviolent resistance to empire, therefore nonviolent civil disobedience. And once there's a story where the apostles are arrested for disturbing the peace, they're put in jail and they're praying and an angel appears and she releases them and says, go back to the scene of the crime and do it again. Dan Berrigan told me that every one of us has such a gardening angel. And its name is the Angel of Recidivism. <laughs> I love that. My third point, therefore, not, I hope you're with me here still, uh, nonviolent civil disobedience. This is so obvious, but just to say it, has to be nonviolent and civil. <laughs> we really don't see anybody as enemies, including the police and the soldiers. It only works if you're rooted in total nonviolence which means you have to be loving, prayerful, peaceful, mindful, centered in God and the vision that we're all one and that we don't kill people, but we don't sit by silently and we're not complicit in the structures. We are standing up publicly like Jesus to resist. Um, so we have to be really thinking about and preparing and talking about nonviolence now, every day for the rest of our life. Before we act, while we're acting, during the action, in jail, and after the action, that we can try to be as nonviolent through and through, to know deep down and live Gandhi's teachings that the means are the end, or Jesus' teachings in the Sermon on the Mount, that you reap what you sow, that the only way to a nonviolent outcome is nonviolent means. The only way to peace and the God of peace is through peaceful means. So uh, our, our actions... All our demonstrations, our, our work in this world of insanity is going to test our nonviolence. Now we get to pra practice what we've been talking about, um, which means if you were with Martin Luther King, you had to, you couldn't just do civil disobedience with Martin Luther King. You had to go to a training, which were three hours long, and they did role playing so that you were, they... <laughs> You practice standing in front of somebody who is going to be yelling at you, threatening you, beating you up, so that you could be nonviolently, instinctively like Dr. King and Jesus. So uh, that's going to lead to my next um, point. But we, we want to become as nonviolent and civil as Gandhi, Dorothy Day, Dr. King, and Thich Nhat Hanh. Fourth, so nonviolent civil disobedience requires meticulous preparation in every aspect. Now, I don't say that lightly either. It means so many things, and I could talk forever about this, but working on your fears. Jesus says, do not be afraid and do not be angry. Okay, you got to work on that. You got to grieve, forgive everybody, surrender our resentment, but also surrender our fears, share our fears with one another, surrender our fears to God, I could tell great stories about that, but it's very liberating and healing because we should be doing this anyway, but especially if we're going to stand up publicly and confront systemic injustice uh, in a spirit of Christian love. So we don't act alone because we're all so frail. We need community and we're always trying to build community, which means we're always trying to make friends with one another. And we share our expectations with one another including our fears and our struggles. And when you're having a bad day, someone in the group can, is having a good day and they can encourage you and strengthen you and vice versa. And you want to be prepared for every possibility from the worst happening to the, you're not getting arrested, which can be very disappointing. And so we're ready for anything. And because uh, we're with friends and we're kind and patient and loving and we've done our role playing and we are discerning and we're praying uh, for guidance. What do you want me to do, God? Is this what you want me to do? Um, is this your will? Which means we have to go dig deep interiorly and check, why am I doing this? To let go of not just the you go from anger and fear, but then 
down to pride and ego and self-righteousness and focusing on God and the truth of action of the action and breathing in the Holy Spirit of peace from now on, especially as you walk through an action. I prepared for my plowshares action for 10 years, friends. I'm not kidding you. And full time for the year before, because we were preparing for 20 years in prison or to be shot and killed. Um, so the key for all of this preparation is to walk in humility and love and service to God and discipleship to community and and utter unconditional service to humanity and creation. So no judgmentalism, no ego, and no self-righteousness. It's all God all the time. You may have to learn a little Buddhism to practice com you know, mindfulness and compassion. And um, you go into court, you're going to give witness. That's the early Christian way. And, and, and that's the gospels are loaded with that testimony, witness, uh, and you're witnessing to God and God's higher law. And you're also international law, and you're trying to address the laws which legalize the destruction of the planet. And really, the best way to do that in the world is in the court, which are the flip side of the cultures legalizing the destruction of the planet, if you see. Um, and we want the judges to find us not guilty, and then to find the corporations and governments guilty of violating international law and God's law of killing people and destroying Mother Earth. And then if you're doing your homework, you want to prepare for jail. You, you want to be ready for anything. And that means you begin to see jail and prison as a new monastery for peace and nonviolence, where you get to pray and intercede for humanity and creation full time and be with Jesus. Which brings me to the last and most important point, which I tried to make in my book, Nonviolent civil disobedience is an act of prayer. It's a nonstop prayer. It's a living prayer for all of humanity, all the creatures, and all of creation. And so it's sacramental. When you see, means from now on, with every step and every breath, we are begging the creator to save creation and humanity, to give us God's reign of nonviolence and help us to do our part to end all the wars and injustices, nuclear weapons, fossil fuels, and global destruction. So we're praying all day long, especially throughout, before, during, and after an action, your will be done, your reign of peace come. So that we can come together, if you will, social channels of God's social transforming grace of the Holy Spirit, like say the civil rights movement, then we can go to the court. We take our prayer before the judge and the court. And we can go to jail like Dr. King. And here, here's Martin's quote. We go to the jail and we transform those dungeons of despair and darkness into havens of hope and holiness. Oh, my God. And we become monks for peace. I remember, you know, I was put in the jail cell with Philip Berrigan. I ended up in eight months. We never left the cell. And I'm thinking of that line from Dr. King. And I'm going... I don't know, Martin, and because all we had was the toilet at each other. It was a, it was something. It was the most difficult experience of my life and also the most richly blessed. So this is not a political work, though it has social, economic, and political consequences. But it's a spiritual act. It's our spiritual life. It's a spiritual movement where we're opening ourselves and surrendering ourselves completely to God, the Creator, and letting God's Holy Spirit work through us and use us as disciples of the nonviolent Jesus to stand up for Mother Earth and suffering humanity and give witness um, to the God of peace and the nonviolent Jesus. I hope that was helpful. Thank you for listening. God bless you all. Wow. John, timing. That you was said thirty minutes on time as well, <laughs> John. Do well, let's keep John in the spotlight as well, so that we can, um, so that we can have a time of of questions for John. Um, I, there are just so many things that I'm going to remember from that. Um, with 
this Jesus being a one man crime crime wave walking through <laughs> Jerusalem. I'm not going to forget that in a hurry. And uh, and uh, and I, something I never heard Jesus say, but obviously he did. Love your aim, enemies, don't nuke them. So it's a new one. Well, I, I'll, I, I'll look for it. Uh, I told the judge that the way I said it in court was. Jesus said, love your enemies, don't nuke them. And I paused and said, that's the actual translation from the original Greek. <laughs> Sue, that didn't go over well. Anyway, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Val. <laughs> I think for the recording, Joe, is it possible to spotlight John and me, or is that not possible? Not not, not managing to do that. Maybe just John then, um, or pin us both or something so that people can see who, who they're talking to. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. You can send them to Val and she will make sure that, that I get them um, to pass them on. Um, we've already got one in from Val, which was for John, which was, John, what, what's what been the most challenging aspect of what you do? And maybe it was that cell with Phil, Philip Berrigan, but maybe not. The what? Uh, being in jail with Phil? Um... Well, I don't know. What was the most challenging thing for you? Well, I i mean, so i this has been a way, of, this is just my life story, you know? It's a way of life for me. You be raised by the Berrigans and Tutu and Thich Nhat Hanh. You end up with a long criminal record and a serious problem with recidivism. Um, but uh, a couple, two thoughts come to mind. I mean, the most disappointing thing, I expect the jailers, the police, the politicians to be violent and mean and nasty. That's the whole culture is brainwashed everywhere. I mean, what do they think they're, you know, <laughs> I always used to joke, we hammered on a nuclear weapon and there was some naivete that you have as a Christian peacemaker where you think they're going to go, what are you doing? And then, I, we're here to dismantle this weapon of death. And they're going to go, oh, what were we thinking? Oh, go right ahead. No, that's not what happens. They get mad. They arrest you. Your family and friends freak out. You know, uh, I lost a lot of friends and friends in the peace movement, interestingly, because they, they, were, they were most threatened because they understood what I was doing. But I learned all this from Dan and studying Gandhi and King. And Jesus says this over and over. I think the gospel only makes sense from the perspective of nonviolence. That's why I've written this new book. It's called The God of Peace, reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke from the perspective of nonviolence. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. He's saying you're going to get hurt. But what was most challenging was uh, church people, you know, um, other priests, Jesuits, bishops, ministers, so many church people totally supporting war, nuclear weapons, the far right, even climate change. And you see it everywhere in the whole world. Well, that's because we've had 1700 years of brainwashing that. It's just that Val, I, you know, even since, especially when I was younger, I didn't know, you know, I didn't realize what we were up against. Because I don't, I mean, other Christians being so insane. And that's why I came to the conclusion, if you read the Gospel of John carefully, which is written 50 years after the others, he says, Christians are the problem. And this is what Gandhi said, too. Because we're the only ones not daring to follow the nonviolent Jesus all the way to the cross. I, I could give you one other story that was a uh, challenging to me. All this is challenging to me too. You know, uh, I've been through so much in so many war zones. I lived in El Salvador in, in 1985 with the Jesuits who were later killed that I've worked through a lot of my fears. Um, but, you know, I'm working through my anger and ego, and I would really stress, don't make the mistakes that I made. That's why I said it when I was a kid, which was self-righteousness. This is what everybody has to do. I made a lot of mistakes. But I'll just quickly try to tell you one story that was a revelation to me. I'm in jail with Philip Berrigan. We're facing four, 20 years in prison. 
He's in the bottom bunk. I'm in the top bunk. Every day we each got 50 letters. We didn't know we were going to get out after eight or nine months. And hundreds, literally thousands of letters, every one of them saying, I wish I had the courage you all had. And I'm I'm reading these letters and going, yeah, so do I, you know, because I was just a kid and I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm with Phil. Phil is like a tough general. And one day he's reading this letter. I don't know if I if you read this, Sue. And he says to me, these people, they don't know anything. Every one of them is writing, I wish I had your courage. Can you believe that, John? I don't know what the heck he was talking about, because I wish I had more courage. And I said to him, no, Phil, I can't believe it. That's just appalling. Tell me more. What do you mean? Because I didn't know what the heck he was talking about. This giant who'd faced life in prison was on the cover of Time Magazine. And he says this line to me. They don't seem to get that it has nothing to do with courage. It's all about faith. Well, you could have knocked me off my cell block. He's saying, "Are you? do you believe in God or not? Do you follow Jesus or not? I mean, this is the story. It's not brain surgery. It's not rocket science. This is what our guy did, and we're following him. You're going to die anyway. You might as well go all the way and follow him to the cross, which means nonviolent civil disobedience against climate injustice and war. And, you know, we're probably not going to be killed. Phil did 11 years of his life in prison, and he influenced millions and millions of people. Anyway, that was a teaching moment. Thank you. Um, we've got another question here. So with Just Up Oil, um, we walk slowly down London roads, normally London, not only London, um, slowing the traffic down for a short while, and it upsets the public quite a lot. Does that count as nonviolent civil disobedience, John? Well, you know, it's definitely following Jesus as long as it's nonviolent. So you're going to get a reaction. The thing about nonviolence, as Dr. King defined it, is the culture of violence and war and the corporations and the fossil fuel companies, they're trying to say to you, there's nothing you can do. You are powerless. And as followers of the nonviolent Jesus, learning this from Gandhi and Dr. King, we're learning, no, nonviolence means we have power. And as together we stand up in power, the power of nonviolence in prayer, like Satyagrahis, Gandhi and Satyagrahis, people of universal nonviolent love, when we stand up publicly, we are provoking a reaction. And King went through a lot to get, you can see, he explains it in the letter from the Birmingham jail that, you know, we're going to keep acting until we provoke a response. And, uh, you know, they lock us up and put us away or the injustice falls. You know, the fossil fuel industry falls. The nuclear weapons are abolished. And that's what our journey is. So, yes, we have to take to the streets and march. There's a quote from King at the end of his life. He's saying, there's nothing greater than the sound of the tramp, tramp boots of marching for justice and peace. Um, and Cesar Chavez, the great hero of nonviolence, told me when I was a kid. He's quoting Gandhi. Nonviolence doesn't come from a conference. Doesn't come from the pulpit. Doesn't come just in peace doesn't come in the classroom. It comes out on the streets and then in courts and then in jails. And Gandhi goes further on the gallows, on the cross. So civil disobedience is defined by Henry David Thoreau, the great man, the abolitionist who wrote the, the great essay on the duty of civil disobedience, which influenced Tolstoy, which then influenced Gandhi. I have a copy here, and I read it when I was 18, and I was um, uh, at, at Duke, and I was in trouble ever since. Um, so he wrote about breaking unjust laws. We obey just laws. The traffic stop, the traffic light, you know. Uh, we disobey unjust laws, which say 
in the 1960s, only black people uh, can only go to the bathroom over there. White people can over here. White people only in the front of the bus. So Martin Luther King is leading the Montgomery bus boycott to break a lake, the break the unjust segregation laws. What do you do in the face of climate change and nuclear weapons, which are global? Well, we are, we are, there is international law. And there are the Nuremberg principles, which I've studied a lot and we've used in court a lot. But we also talk about God's higher law, which you can quote from St. Paul. And um, you heard me speak of the law of nonviolence. Um, so then you're getting into civil disobedience, which is engaging the law, which legalizes mass murder and the destruction of the planet. So that's not just marching. And that's why I phrased what I said very carefully. All of this is active public nonviolence. Cesar Chavez to me said to me, tell everybody for the rest of your lives, public action, public action, public action. But what I was asked to talk about is civil disobedience. And that's why I'm saying you and I with Sue and others today and elsewhere are on the front lines of the marches where we're gonna kneel down or sit in and put our bodies on the line and break the law. And we may not even be sure what law it is. And, you know, if you, we, we demonstrated at the White House, the actual law is incommoding <laughs> from the 1800s. It's not even disturbing the peace. How do you engage the law which legalizes weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons? That's why we, you touch the weapon in the plowshares action. Then we put the weapons on trial. We're, we're engaging in new creative nonviolence here in the U.S. with Bill McKibben and 350.org and all the great groups, you know, going into the banks and um, what we did with Jane Fonda, where we're saying, you know, sitting by and doing nothing and allowing the fossil fuel companies to continue is totally against international law and the creator. But we're still learning our way with that. So, it is different to answer your question. What we're talking about is different. You're certainly following Jesus non, and not everybody has to do nonviolent civil disobedience, but some of us have to be on the front lines. And that's what I heard Sue asking me to speak about today. So that's why I was talking the way I was. I don't tell everybody this. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, oh, we've got, we've got quite a few more just coming in. Um, so first of all, you talked about how diff how the Christians that that has always been really difficult for you. And we've got a question here from um, Kathy saying, "How do you live in forgiveness of church leaders not following the nonviolent Christ? How do you keep the desire to follow this Jesus uppermost of all human human emotions of fed upness? <laughs> Sorry, with really poor leadership." Well, thank you for that. Um, I think you can feel the frustration there, John. Oh, There's yeah. Tell me all about feeling. it. I mean, <laughs> I'm banned from talk, giving talks on Jesus in 30 dioceses in the United States. I mean, you wouldn't believe what I've been through. The civil media is just like the tip of the iceberg. Um, so uh, I don't even know where to begin. But, you know, how do you forgiveness? It's all there in the Sermon on the Mount and the Gospel. Everything how to do all of this is in the gospel. I read the read the gospel every day my whole life. And, for the last, and Gandhi read the Sermon on the Mount er, from every parts of it every morning, every evening for the last 40 years of his life, Matthew chapter 5, and he wasn't a Christian. Do you all do that? And that's what I've been trying to do these last 20 years. So we're talking really serious prayer. Gandhi did two hours a day. I'm trying to do that now. I've done half an hour a day for 45 years, but that's baloney. I mean, we live in a world, it's, and don't, it's not piety. I'm talking about survival and following Jesus. It's not, I'm, I'm a mess. I'm an addict of violence. I'm a, a white American, entitled, rich cleric, well-educated, you know, I'm the problem. But I, how do, where, how do I non-violently love myself, love everybody and follow this non-violent Jesus on the way of the cross? So um, prayer, studying, and then, 
you take a step out into the public, they don't want to give you the Nobel Peace Prize. They want to start yelling at you. It begins with your parents and your brothers and sisters and your friends, and you lose your job. I could tell you so many stories. A lot of, as Dan taught me, a lot of people walk away from you, but then a lot of new people come into your life. And that's why it's so important to make friends among everybody in the Zoom, everybody in the Christian climate action. Making friends is part of the work. Because uh, Thomas Merton said, do not place your hope in results. Leave the outcome in God's hands. Focus on the relationships and the love. God will use us in, the, in God's own good time. And we, we're letting go. So a lot of this is kenosis, letting go, self-emptying. And that begins with, I listed some of it, ego, anger. Well, what's anger? Resentment. And why are you resentful? Because the bishop didn't do this, or the pope, or the priest, or the minister, or your own family, or everybody, and you're so mad. And that's not following Jesus. Thank you, John. That, oh, no, got, I got to really... tell you the remedy. The remedy, Talia, uh, is it. it Talia or Val talking? It's, I'm talking, Talia. Oh, Talia. Uh, so if this is what took me a lifetime, and it was only in the 90s, after I got out of prison. If someone, Peter says, if my brother does this, do I have to forgive him seven times a day? Think about it. That's a lot. And Jesus says, no, 70 times, seven times a day. I'm not good at math, but I think that's 490 times a day you should be forgiving people. Well, that's what I do, because I have a long list of resentments. And I started this, I can remember, in 1997, I was living in Belfast. And I forgive people all day long. I forgive them. I let it go. I let go of my resentments. I let go of my anger. I don't have time for this. Now, I could talk all day about that journey because it's it, it eats me. The resentment doesn't get, it does no good. And you pray for the person really hard. But then I'm with Tutu in South Africa 10 years ago. And he, he said to me, he hit me and said, John, you better work for peace and justice for the rest of your life. And I hit him back, Talia, and I because we were real close. I said, man. How am I going to do that? How do you do that, Desmond? And he got, this is when you, you know, these great people, he got real close to me and he said, I cry. Then he burst into tears and he said, I've cried every day over my life about the world since I was five. And he told me about that. And then he said, I laugh. And I've laughed every day of my life since I was five. And then he started making fun of me and burst out laughing. Now, but then I remember thinking, oh, he follows the Sermon on the Mount. Um, blessed are those who grieve and blessed are those persecuted. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great. For now you're like Gandhi and Dr. King. So grief and joy and forgiveness are the path. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. We have so many questions come now. Um, I think people, but I, I'm going to try and pull a few of them together because there's a lot around, because Just Stop Oils uh, currently is um, working on doing slow marching in the roads, which is disruptive to people. There's a lot of questions around right. that. So there's, let me just give you some ideas. Um, blocking my fellow citizens by slow walking. Uh, you know, they didn't plan to do that. I'm not sure that's non-violent. They didn't plan to have their day disrupted. I'd rather block a coal train or a nuclear base. I have doubts about blocking my fellow citizens. Um, yeah. And then I fear slow walking or blocking my fellow citizens will backfire on the movement. But first of all, do you think it's non-violent? I think you've addressed that. Oh, um, that's really great. Yeah, really so, so great. So if you could bring those together, and then I have some others yeah. for you as well. So. Yeah. Uh <laughs> wow I, I have done so many things and you never know what's going to happen but the question is is it nonviolent? is it god's will is this what god wants that's the question not what i want not what other people want and don't expect every, a mass conversion and everybody go oh thank you <laughs> no they're gonna they called martin luther king every name in the book he goes into Birmingham 
Alabama. They put him in jail and they're saying, you're disrupting us. You're dividing us. He said, you're the most divided city in the country. That's what segregation is. He's provoking a response, you see. So I can't tell you. And this is where the preparation is. For every action you do, you need lots and lots of meetings. And that's why you have to be kind and patient with one another and go around, share a little bit, come up with one or two or three plans and say, well, is this what I want? Is this nonviolent? And I think I mentioned, I can't remember. I mean, in general, it seems to me where we are right now, I'm not telling Christian Climate Action what to do, but you might do what I call Civil Disobedience 101, which is first grade level, kindergarten level, or freshman in college level, we call it. And by that, I mean, that's what Jane Fonda did. She just invited the whole country. We're going to shut down the U.S. Capitol every Friday. And then the pandemic came and it stopped. But look it up, fire drill Fridays. So it was very simple, but it was clearly violating the law. And it was clearly nonviolent. And it had a very clear point. And that's why I mentioned our campaigns in Nevada, the Riverside Research Institute, the School of the Americas, so many places I've done. We, we've kept it really simple. Other actions are just for a small group of people, five. I mean, there were only four in my plowshares actions where you're you're really getting into the law and we hammered on a nuclear weapon. That's not what I'm talking about here for everybody. What we need are thousands of people doing nonviolent civil disobedience against the fossil fuel industry and the whole thing. Remember, Gandhi had 300,000 people in jail, in prison, doing up to 10 years each during World War II. That's incredible bar, he said. We have in the U.S. now like three. So uh, so what does that mean? Um, uh, I, I think you want to plan well, I, I don't know about slow walking. I've never done that. I'm not sure I would do that because I don't know that it would communicate so well. And I'm interested in communicating and having the media there and showing them what we're doing, but being detached from the media at the same time, if you're with me, that we're not we're doing this for the truth and the rightness of our action, not to get media coverage. And because uh, we're entering into suffering love and it's prayer and it's God. If you have doubts about blocking, you don't want to do that. And are things going to backfire in the movement? Of course they are. But, you know, that's what happens in the plowshares. That's why what you could do is organize very simple nonviolent civil disobedience actions all over. Now, in the U.S., even to say this on the Zoom is illegal. So we're legally, I would say, I didn't say that. I'm talking about nonviolent direct action, hint, hint. But what we're saying is you bring, like two days ago, 50 people went to the White House and it was open to many people trained and they knelt down to protest the U.S. support of Israel and the, and, and the occupation and the war. You see what I'm saying? Um, so you want to make it user friendly. And so I think these are very rich ideas, and that's where you have to read and study and learn from people who have done this many times before. But you're under something with all those questions, everybody. That's why you need a group. In the U.S., we call them affinity groups. So during the for the Iraq war, for example, we had hundreds of affinity groups around the country where you're not alone. So the group, let's say the group has 15 people living in a town. Maybe four of them might do the civil disobedience, but the rest of them are a part of the group. You're all a team. Some are legal participants and some are CD participants, but you're all together and you're sorting through what is it you want to do? Who's going to do what? Who's going to be the support to the people who may end up in jail? All of that. We could talk all day about that. I That might be in my book. I don't remember. Anyway, Tally, I could go on and on, but yeah, it's almost I midnight. We it is, and well, it's not really. But we are just going to ask you one more question, if that's okay, and then we will we will move on. Um, and there are others, and I'm sorry to people who have not been able to get to your questions or have not been able to round them up in that other uh, longer question. But I think uh, it would be good to ask this question, which is: Christians may be involved in actions with other groups who may not espouse the principles of non-violent civil disobedience. How do we handle that? Non-violently. And with love. Now, I don't mean to be facetious, but 
There are many people in the United States, most people doing public good work for justice and discernment and creation are not Christians now. I'm sorry to be so down. You know, and what young person would have anything to do with the church anymore in the United States? I don't know about the UK, been there many times, met a lot of you, but um, so we're talking about, <laughs> we're in a post-Christian world, you know, and it's a whole new moment. And, uh, but here's the story of Jesus. We have the gospel and you and I can say, I'm going to follow him. I can't do it alone, so I'm going to get together in communities. And we've got this nice Christian climate action and many other nice groups. And we love everybody. And we're going to be nonviolent with everybody. And we can tell people in our small groups, you know, I work with all religions. And people with no religion have been arrested with many people of who no religions or different religions. And persuaded them that if the more nonviolent we are, the better the action will be. If we go in yelling, screaming, and violent, it's not going to work. Personally, I don't get involved in actions that are violent. I never have. And I've never done a violent, nonviolent civil disobedience. I've never done a violent civil disobedience action. Never. I've only done meticulously nonviolent actions. So then you get small and you find small is beautiful because uh, as you could, <laughs> when you look at the Jesus movement, you say, what happened to him? You go, well, a good peace movement starts out small and gets smaller. <laughs> but we are following him and we, we the outcome is in his hands. We want to be as nonviolent, prayerful, as loving as, as Jesus. But I would have acted with Gandhi. And I would have acted with Gabriel Ghaffar Khan and Thich Nhat Hanh and, you know, these other sweet, beautiful people who are far more nonviolent and forgiving and compassionate than me. And they have so much more to teach me. So that the the, the the that's why I'm talking about humility here. You know, all the days of self righteousness and ego are over. We're on the verge of destroying the planet. We're all in the same boat with everybody. In the end, there are no more enemies. There's no more us and them. Even within the movement, we're all one. We join hands with each other. We make friends with each other. We make friends with their enemies. We cross all different boundaries, borders, religions, and join hands to stand up to say no to the killing of our sisters and brothers and the creatures and the destruction of Mother, Mur Mother Earth. And we try to be as nonviolent as we can and welcoming and inclusive as we can and careful. Jesus is so amazing. You be... Innocent as doves, but wise as serpents. So we're gentle and nonviolent like a dove and a lamb, but we're smart and we're sneaky and we know what we're doing as he was smart and careful and meticulous. And it's exciting, y'all. You know, you don't have to be bored. Now we get to follow Jesus and we get to be as universally loving as him and go to the cross. Isn't this exciting? And we're risking resurrection. You know, this is the best thing we can do with our lives in this bad time. And we're not the savior of the world. That's already happened. All we have to do is do our little, our little part, our wee bit on the journey in his wake uh, to create a global wave of disarming, creative nonviolence to protect creation and humanity. So I really thank you all very, very much for all the great good that you're doing. And I wish you all the best. I'm with you in spirit as you go forth to stand up. And uh, thanks so much, Talia, for having me. And of course, Sue and Val and Joe and Caroline. And I wish you all the best. God bless you. Thank you. John, thank you so much. I think we've all just been kind of listening and kind of wanting to hear more and more and just overwhelmed by your humility and the vastness of, of the things that you've learned and you've been able to share with us. The the idea that, you know, let's just let's just live out the Beatitudes, let's just follow Jesus and this opportunity to be universally I thought you were going to say universally hated because that's what it feels like sometimes, but actually universally loving is what you said. Yeah. And, and I'm going to hang on to that and yeah. being so encouraging and having so much um, energy 
and of course it's your morning it's our evening yeah. <laughs> but thank you so much um sure. talia and i'll say goodbye and good night and god bless you and see you in jail someday down the road you um just to give you if you've been inspired by what you've heard so far and we're not finished yet but if you've been inspired by what you've heard so far these are three books that we really highly recommend so the first one is the one that john wrote about civil disobedience i found it life-changing the sacrament of civil disobedience um you get it all and you can spend your time on it instead of having to uh, just listen to him on a zoom meeting um, it's the Civil Resistors Field Guide to Nonviolent Civil Disobedience that's rooted in faith. Um, it's it's a fast read. You it, you can't put it down and then you have to go back to it. It's really, really good. Can't recommend it enough. In the middle, you've got Time to Act. I, I, that also, I think, is just so accessible and so such a useful um, book. It's got contribu contributions from around 40 people who are either involved with or support Christian Climate Action. And um, while I'm speaking, I'm hoping that, because uh, I can't see everything at the moment, um, Val, you're going to put the links to these where we can buy these books into the chat. Um, so there'll be some uh, three links for that coming up. And then finally, but last but not least, and but hottest off the press is Bodies on the Line, which is written by Sue, who introduced John earlier, um, which was published in August this year, which is... Is also around civil disobedience and really gives um, a really strong um, understanding of, I think it comes from a real heart of, of love from Sue. And um, yeah, you feel that you're sitting there with Sue and she's just explaining it all to you, which is a lovely place to be um, anyway. Um, That's the first thing that would be the first thing to do. So if you're new to, to Christian Climate Action, if you've not joined us before, we've got a meeting on the 31st of August, uh, October, right? rather, more soon than August. Um, so it's just kind of come in, just chat to people, find out what you want. It's much more relaxed. There's not a kind of pro forma or anything. And Val is going to put the link to that so you can register for that into the chat as well. Um, you can also sign up for our newsletter, um, which means you'll be kept in touch with all we're doing. Maybe you'll think, oh, yes, that's something I want to do, uh, or I'd like to find out more about that. So Val's also going to put the link to that in the chat, I hope, um, christianclimateaction.org forward slash newsletter. So don't miss out on that. Get all your information there. We, this is an action that we've got coming up. It's uh, about the National Trust. So asking the National Trust to stop banking with Barclays because Barclays is the biggest funder of fossil fuels in Europe. We're going to have a vigil outside their AGM. But also, if you've got a National Trust membership, you could maybe even go into the building and ask a question. So um, to find out more about that, there's another link going into the chat. And um, just, a, 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 just if you're worried about kind of capturing all these links, if you click on them, they'll open up. Then they'll be in your browser and then you can just click back onto the zoom thing on the bottom of your uh, computer and you'll be back in the zoom so you, you won't lose us if you click on them and that will save them for you um and sorry so much information but we've got other things to do so the saturday sessions we have a saturday sessions um every uh every week and I'm just going to do a little plug because on the 21st of October and the 28th of October, we're going to be looking at the Gospel of Mark as a manual for civil resistance, which sounds like it's really tied in in the same way as um, uh, John was talking about finding civil resistance right through uh, the Gospel and using it to, to guide us, really. So very welcome to come along to those. Um, and then just in case you hadn't guessed all of those things, you can find them on the website and you can find information about a local group, local vigils, other local actions, online morning and evening prayers. We meet together every morning and some evenings, how to start a local group, lots of practical resources. Last but very much not least, um, Christian Climate Action is primarily funded by one off and regular donations from individuals. We want also to honour John for his time um, that he spent with us this evening. So gifts that, that go in today or tomorrow, some of that is going to be uh, donated to, to John to support him in the amazing 
work that he's doing. And I think you'll find another link has popped into the chat um, on how, how you can donate and support this. And, you know, you might want to think of it as like, oh, I just had a free evening out. Maybe I want to just pay something um, in thank you for, 